Welcome to the Simple Steps Personal Finance Podcast. Bringing personal finance to you step by step. This is episode 9. Thank you for listening. Before we start, I just want to remind you of my Christmas offer. As you know, this podcast is designed to help you help yourself. For those who are still put off making changes by yourselves or feel you would achieve better results by having personal guidance, I offer my personal finance coaching. My gift to you this year is a discount on my current rates. For one month, covering the end of December and start of January, I'm reducing my starter package cost by 20%. That's three 90-minute coaching sessions with two bonus 45-minute catch-ups and it will now cost only £200, that's £50 off. This package is designed to give us a generous window of three months to assess and improve your financial picture, improve your behaviours with money, and help you keep more of your money each month. With regular catch-ups to keep you motivated and combat any issues you may have encountered. This package can also be given to someone else as a gift, so keep it in mind as you meet with friends and family over the festive period. Helping someone gain control of their money is a gift that lasts much longer than one Christmas. This episode, we are going to tie up many of the ideas we've talked about in previous episodes by looking at how best we can make this behaviour automatic and not allow ourselves to move off our desired path and get out of control of our money. How to make the carrying out, the execution of our goals, automatic. Like anything good for you, motivation gets you started, but it's habit that keeps you going. So let's remove the possibility of falling off the wagon and make our money work every month without needing constant oversight from us. Now, why do we want to do this? How do we achieve it? Is it difficult to supervise? I'll be looking into all aspects in this episode. Let's start with a bit of human behaviour. When it comes to overhauling your finances and changing the way you deal with your money, willpower is usually high to start with. You want to change your wealth for the better. And that willpower stays strong for the first few weeks or or months of any changes. So why then aren't you ultimately successful? It's not a lack of willpower that stops this success. The act of keeping financially on track is, is like walking the wrong way through a crowd. You're forever being bumped off course. So the question then becomes, how do we stay on course when life throws 101 things at us every week? Now in my experience, and the way I have found most successful for my own finances, is to look to automate as much of your financial picture as possible. As we've talked about on the previous episodes, we know we get paid into one current account, transferring some money to a secondary current account for our spending cash, another amount to our slush fund or savings, and another amount to a long-term investment account, perhaps. Now, carrying out these transfers manually, every payday, it could prove a bit of a temptation. You know the way you're not meant to shop on an empty stomach? Well, don't make money decisions when you've just been paid. Chances are you'll want to spend too much on inessential knee-jerk items. So instead of manually doing those transfers, we could in fact choose to have the same transfers done every month automatically. The two methods for this are direct debit and standing order. The way a direct debit works is quite straightforward. You you give permission to a supplier to take money from your account. Now it's usually a set amount on a set date, like £50 each month to your gym. But it can be variable, like a TV package or a mobile phone. The more you watch or download, the higher the bill will be. However, many suppliers building a discount to their pricing for customers who use direct debits because of the lower admin they need to do chasing payment. There's no more paper bills being sent out and paying money in at the post office. So that's a direct debit. What about standing orders? Well, this is something that you design yourself through your bank account. If a direct debit pulls money out of your account, a standing order pushes it out. It's a subtle difference, but it keeps the control in your hands. You decide how much you want to send and where you want it to go. In most instances, standing orders are best used to transfer money to your other accounts, like sending money to a cash ISA or a savings account or an investment account. Give it the SOAR code, account number, say how much and how often to do it. It's very straightforward and your online banking will make it a quick affair to set up and maintain. 
So they're your two tools for automation, direct debit and standing order, your new best friends. Picture the scene then. You get paid as normal on payday, your utility bills, rent, mortgage, mobile phone, TV provider, broadband, gym, they all take payment from that account by direct debit. Zero hassle, fully self-sufficient. On payday, you have a standing order that transfers your spending cash for the month to your second current account, your discretionary spending account. You're now free to swipe your debit card up and down the country till your heart's content or the money runs out. A couple of days after you're paid, a standing order fires off money to your rainy day fund. Now, a little tip. It's best to set up some transfers a few days after you get paid, in case your employer has payroll issues and is late in paying you. And now another direct debit is actioned, which takes money out of your first account to pay your investment company to buy another slice of a long-term investment for you. Now, how much of that manually occurred? Nothing. Just you swiping your card whenever you fancy a coffee or a sandwich or a night out. Now, does that sound good? Good. Let's dig in a bit more then. See how I can flesh out some bits and pieces for you. Maybe give you some tips I've picked up along the way. Firstly, let me mention a weird quirk in our psychology. If you don't see something, you don't miss it. Think about your pay. You earn a much higher figure than you're paid every month, but taxes and other deductions are made from it, and you get paid your net money. Do you miss the money you paid in taxes? Not really. Sure, you'd, you'd rather not have to pay them at all, but you never had the money in your grasp, so you don't miss it. Now, we're using this principle when we set up one current account for bills and another for spending. You live day to day in your spending account and don't really see the other money in the bills one. Nor do you miss the money you direct debit or standing order over to savings or investment. Out of sight, out of mind. Well, there's one step further you can go. Some of you will be members of a company pension. The rest of you will likely be offered one in the near future, now that they're actually becoming mandatory. If you are a member of a pension, then money is leaving your payslip before it even makes your account. It's what's called deducted at source. It's taken along with taxes so that you don't get the chance to say, I'd rather not this month actually. And that's a hugely good bit of behavior because it means you always contribute money and you seldom think to stop it from happening. Great behavior where long-term investing is concerned. If you don't invest in a company pension or you invest only the amount needed to get the company to add to your contribution, as, as many do, then you may have extra money you wish to put away for the long term. If you do, then you will be looking at having some sort of investment account. A company who you give your money to and then they buy things you've told them to buy, like an index tracker or a growth fund or a certain group of shares. That might be a company like Hargreaves Lansdowne or Charles Stanley, the, the so-called fund supermarkets. Now, by setting up a direct debit to pay them the same monthly contribution, you take the thought process out of that activity. You made a decision to invest, but you shouldn't keep making the same decision to send them the money every month. So that's the benefit of automation. Out of sight, out of mind. Now, I have one small point to make here. Whilst the fund supermarkets are very popular in this country, Hargreaves Lansdowne has around 44 billion of the UK's money. If you have just a couple of investments with the same underlying provider, then it may actually be better to buy directly from them, again using a direct debit, because you'll eliminate the possibility of receiving advice calls. Now the key to long-term investing is to pick a strategy, add money to it regularly, and then do nothing. Don't sell until you need to. Now, some enterprising young salesman, no doubt calling him or herself an advisor, will soon get it into their heads to call you and see if changing your investments can't scratch up a nice commission for them. So be wary of this. These fun supermarkets are merely meeting places for lots of the options out there. You can still go direct in many instances, and any small cost savings or rebates won't be worth much if the supermarket keeps selling you stuff you didn't ask for. Remember, buying and then holding for many years is our goal for long-term investing. I'll do other episodes on investments, your options, the different types, uh, a later time, no doubt. But just remember that little point on fund supermarkets and where you hold your money. For the simple savings account or a cash ISA, automation comes in the form of a standing order. 
you instruct your bank to send money on a certain date regularly. As straightforward as it gets, a real set it and forget it approach. A little tip I can add to this is regarding interest rates on your accounts. Now often, savings accounts and cash ices have rates that are attractive to begin with, but become less so after time. Now this happens because banks want to advertise their new products all the time, so they abandon rewarding the old ones. They also assume you won't notice and still keep your money with them anyway. Well, here's how we show them. There's a nice little tool available from the website Savings Champion. This is a website whose speciality is to track savings rates. They have a, a rate tracker service that will send you an email if your rate changes. Now that sounds like a useful automation tool, and it is. So using it to let you know when your rate may change is a really easy one-off activity. Sign up, then sit back and know that your rate won't change without your knowledge. Good day-to-day -day simplicity. If it's a rainy day fund savings account, remember it's designed to act like insurance on your life. It's there to help you if an emergency suddenly occurs. It's not there to make money necessarily. So don't lock it away to get a higher fixed rate return. It has to stay instantly accessible. But that doesn't mean you can't still look to maximize the rate where possible. Now this reliance on your current accounts to keep forwarding money onto new homes can put you at risk if you were to be paid late or have a bill suddenly change to an unexpected higher amount. So another thing I like to automate is a balance warning. I have accounts with Santander, First Direct, HSBC, and a few other smaller institutions, but as time has gone on, they have all offered some sort of warning system. If the balance in an account goes below a certain designated amount, then an email or text is sent to warn me. This is another thing I'd wholeheartedly recommend adding to your list of actions. It's a great backstop to stop your system from failing. In addition to this, I've found leaving a small buffer amount in my bills account is a wise move. Just 50 or 100 pound might be enough to stop you from going overdrawn if one of your bills comes in higher than expected. Now many bills are fixed and they're unable to change without your consent, but some aren't. Some are variable. So to cover you if you go away on holiday and run up a bigger phone bill or order one too many on-demand movies, then a buffer of cash in that account is useful. Think of it as setting ground level at 50 or 100 pound, that that 50 or 100 pound becomes the new zero. That money doesn't get spent or planned to be spent. It just sits there as protection. So doing this with your spending account is unwise because you'll, well, you've guessed it, you'll spend it. So it's bills account only for this idea. Whilst we're on the subject of protecting ourselves, I like to set up calendar reminders for the longer schedule stuff, the things that I'm more prone to forget, like car tax, MOT, insurance renewals, even bonus rates on accounts finishing, or ISA transfer deadlines. Anything that is easy to forget down the line, it's so easy to set up an email reminder or a calendar reminder nowadays. Something like Google Calendar will sync across all your computers and smartphones, but even simple websites like Future Me will allow you to post-date a reminder email to yourself. Now obviously you need something reliable here, so post-it notes on the fridge door probably aren't the best idea. Hopefully that's shown you the benefits of automating lots of your financial picture. I would always recommend that you log in to important accounts once a week or so though, just to allay any fears you may have and ward off any trouble before it becomes big news, should something unexpected happen. Even with all the reminders we've set up, it's still your money, it's still your responsibility. And having a sense of ownership is crucial for your behavior with money. Always feel like you're still the parent, no matter how well behaved the child seems to be. Now what might we not want to automate? That's also something worth looking into. From my experience, I like to automate all transfers except for my spending cash transfer. Now the reason for this is because it varies based on what I expect to be doing and what else may be happening in my life at that time. I may want to spend more if I'm traveling or I may wish to give up some of my spending cash to do something else somewhere else on my spending plan for that month. Rather than it be a, a fixed amount, I prefer to transfer a different amount each month. In truth, it never varies too much. 
but the fact that I've had to calculate what it will be means that I've sat down and done my spending plan for the upcoming month. It keeps me in good behaviour. So I think of it as the gateway each month. No spending plan, no spending cash. It's also worth pointing out that no two people are the same. For those of us who focus on spending and let the other bits of the jigsaw fill in around that, we find that natural. There are others who focus on savings first, then everything builds up from there. Now I'm a big gym person, so I like to think of it as people who lift weights and count backwards instead of forwards. Not one, two, three, but 10, nine, eight, back to zero. In fact, I read one time that doing it backwards keeps your strength longer, something about the payoff of zero being an incentive, whereas lifting up to 10 has no reward. Anyway, that's a whole other hobby. Let's get back to money. The lesson is that different folks like different strokes. So work in the way that suits you best, that fits with you. Now, if what fits with you is blowing all your money on payday and pulling your hair out for the other 30 days, then you're not hearing me. Work the plan, but work it in a way that makes sense to you. Now, in a later episode, I want to talk about savings rates. Savings rates are the percentage that you save and for how long you must do so until you can become financially independent, whether that be retirement or at some other time in life. Until then, you may wish to count your saving percentage each month. How much of your money is actually being held back for future spending? Now, counting your savings rate or your net worth is a big boost motivation-wise for many people. Your net worth is the total amount of everything you own, known as your assets, minus the total amount you owe to others, known as your liabilities. So everything you own minus everything that you owe. In your early life, it's likely you'll have a very low or even a negative net worth. Student loans, overdrafts and such, they're not going to help. But as you get older and you pay off these debts and you put money into pensions, savings, you buy property, you accrue things, your net worth will go up. So some people like to get reinforcement from watching their net worth go up every time their pension moves or their house gets revalued. Having something you can point to and it show that you are making ground that you have found traction, that you're pushing forward, that's always a good thing for us. Every couple of months or so, it's a nice shot in the arm when you are sacrificing now to make greater things happen later. Welcome to adulthood. My final thoughts today are not to do with how to automate good financial behaviour into our daily lives. It's more about how to spot bad behaviour or how to stop bad behaviour creeping back in. If you were to set out and put in place all of the tips I've given you today, you could be a lean, mean saving machine. From salary to bills, to spending, to investing, your whole life could operate with such low input that you'd be forgiven for forgetting what a bill even looked like. Your rates would be protected on savings, and you'd be warned if balances ever dropped too low. So what could go wrong? Well, in truth, very little. You'd be streets ahead of 99% of the rest of the UK population for the rest of your life. There's no book coming here, I promise. This is the way I think you should set up your financial life so you can go and live your real life to its fullest. Now, this isn't a but. It's just uh, further advice. Putting in barriers to stop you going too low won't help you from reaching ever higher. You may stop your interest rate from falling or your bill account from going overdrawn, but it won't stop you from improving on your already fantastic approach. So my last advice is this, don't take it for granted. As time marches on, your interest rate might no longer be the best on the market. So check to see what deals are around now. What is out there that you could improve things with by moving to it? What about your bills? Are they still competitive? Could you save on your mobile phone now as opposed to that contract you took out last year? Are there better mortgage deals available? Is that TV package underused? The broadband too slow? the gym a dream rather than the reality in your week. So add another calendar reminder. Have an annual checkup. Have a a quarterly checkup. Whatever works for you. Personally, I set calendar reminders for the major things and space them throughout the year so I only have to do one every month or so. That way I can dedicate a couple of hours to a specific task like getting a better deal on my TV and broadband package and then forget about it for another year. Some months it may be car insurance. Others, home insurance or my mobile contract. 
I space it out so the tasks are always achievable and small, not one weekend where I have to do everything all at once. Whatever works for you though. I've known people who can only motivate themselves by taking a day off work and doing everything on that one day, the 24 hour money makeover. Each to their own, at least we're all taking action. And that means we're not like normal people. We're weird. Normal is in debt and out of control. Weird is on plan and under control. Give me weird any day. Next time, it's the 10th podcast. And to mark the occasion, I want to shift gears a little and show you how far we've come together. I'll also lay out my view for the future of this podcast and how I'd like to progress it. In the meantime though, check out my blog at sspf.co.uk slash blog for more financial common sense. Don't forget to spread the word. Financial peace of mind is here to stay. Simple Steps and my personal finance coaching are here to help you. If you're finding this approach useful, or are unsure on how to act, drop me a line and let's see how personal finance coaching can help you. After all, what could be better than having personal guidance tailored to your circumstances? And take advantage of my Christmas discount at sspf.co.uk slash book. Thanks for listening. That's it for episode 9. For more information, check out sspf.co.uk for show notes and transcripts of each episode. This podcast is copyright of Simple Steps, Personal Finance Limited, and can be shared freely. The SSPF podcast is available as direct download on Android, RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Vimeo, and Dailymotion. We're here however you want us. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a review so others know to listen in too. Thanks as always to Partners in Wine for the music used throughout this episode. See you next time.